Turn with me this morning to Ephesians, book of Ephesians, chapter 2. We're thinking today about Jesus, the cornerstone. I um, I was uh, not born with an innate ability to build physical structures. God taught me that right early in my life. When I was in the third grade, I think I've shared this with you at some time in the past. Um, actually, it was second grade. I got a dog. I got my first puppy dog. And uh, it was a cute little dog, and I um, wanted to build it a dog house. It didn't have a house. And so I built a dog house for my little puppy dog, and the first night, the dog house caved in and almost killed my puppy dog. <laughs> I started learning, even as a, a second grader, that I wasn't an innate builder. Now some of you all are and um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute but Christ and God has made a design and he's working a design. He's building a building and we're going to be thinking about that this morning and the cornerstone of that building is Jesus Christ. Of course this is kind of in a symbolic way but there's a lot of real reality if you will that goes along with this. So stand up with me as I read our text this morning. Um, Ephesians chapter 2. We'll start at verse number 17 and read through verse number 20. Ephesians 2 verse 17. Well, let's start at verse 16. I'm going to keep on. We'll be back at Genesis 1 in a minute. Amen. Verse 16. Ephesians 2 16. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross and put the hostility to death by it. Now, as Paul's writing to this church at, uh, at Ephesus, the two that he's talking about, the two distinct groups, are the Jews, the Jewish folks that were there in Ephesus, and the Gentile folks. In other words, everybody that was not a Jew. And I, I think you're probably pretty well aware that there was a lot of uh, division. There was a lot of uh, confusion. There was even, at times, just some open hostility because that had been the kind of the nature that the Jewish folks had grown up with. If you weren't a Jew, if you weren't of Israel, you were goyim. You were just a dog. You know, we, we've talked about that. So that's the scenario. That's the context that we're setting up here. So again, verse 16, he did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross and put the hostility to death by it. When Christ came, he proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. Now here's the building part, verse 20. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, which Christ Jesus himself, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. The whole building is being fitted together in him and is growing into a holy sanctuary in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together, look at this, being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. There's a lot in there, isn't there? I think there's a lot in there we need to hear today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your, your love for us. We thank you for your master plan. We thank you that you're the master builder. And that you started this whole creation with a plan in place, a plan in mind. And even to this very day, you're working your plan. The Lord, help us to see that clearer than ever. Help us to really see with understanding what you're doing in our lives and what you're doing in the world today as you're building this masterpiece of which we're going to be a part for your great namesake. In Jesus' name, 
I pray. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead and turn back to Isaiah chapter 28. <clears throat> Isaiah 28. Uh, my, our daughter, Emily, is now married. Most of you all know that. Emily got married. <clears throat> Amen. And you all, most of you all have met Jeff, our son-in-law. <clears throat> now, our son, you may not know much about Jeff, but, but Jeff is an architectural engineer. It just so happens he is a graduate of the University of Alabama. And a Canadian, of all things. Our daughter married an Alabama Crimson Tide Canadian. I'm looking forward to that game, amen. I'm going to make them stay in Memphis when we, anyway. So he's an architectural engineer. He works for this uh, company in Memphis, where they live in Memphis. <clears throat> you see one of his uh, latest things that he designed and built, headed up the building of it, is right there on the Mississippi River when you go across that <clears throat> Interstate 40 bridge into Memphis. If you look over on right on the bank over there, you'll see this big, massive concrete structure. And what it is, it's a landing dock for tugboats and for uh, those uh, Ferris wheel boats, you know, that go up and down the river. <clears throat> and the design of it's pretty cool because the landing area has to adjust with the height of the water and all that. Well, our son-in-law is the architectural engineer that designed it and built it. So I'm a little intimidated because I don't know how to build nothing. <clears throat> well, a few years ago, before my, our daughter met this guy, I built a tree house for my grandchildren, like any loving grandfather would do. Amen? And not only, I wanted to build an exquisite tree house. And so what I did in that sweet gumball tree over on the other side of the parsonage, and y'all be... Feel free to go inspect. Has anybody figured out what sweet gum balls are for? Trouble. Trouble. I built a tri-level treehouse for my grandkids. Three levels. When did you ever build a tri-level <laughs> greenhouse for your grandkids? Still up. Well, about a year ago, our son-in-law... The architectural engineer goes out to inspect my treehouse. <laughs> I thought I had him dazzled. I thought it was the razzle-dazzle. Because my son-in-law, he started at the top and just kind of dropped his gaze until he got to the bottom. And he just froze with a look of bewilderment. I started to get nervous. I mean, he was just like paralyzed. And then I realized that his paralysis was due to horror. Why are you laughing? Because the entire tree, if you build a tri-level tree house, I had to design a way to support part of it that stuck out to hold up three different levels. So I got a two by eight piece of wood, a real nice treated piece of wood, but I didn't want to just stick it on the dirt because the wicking effect would take, it would wick up water eventually and start rotting out the bottom of it. <clears throat> so I had this great idea and I got a cinder block. A concrete block, you know one of those about like that? <clears throat> and I laid it down on the ground <clears throat> in perfect alignment. And I put the two by eight piece of treated wood so that it sits on top of the cinder block. And it basically holds up three levels of my treehouse. And for some reason, my son-in-law, Jeff, when he saw the foundation stone that I had laid. Well, let's put it this way. My 
grandchildren have not been allowed in the treehouse <laughs> since. That day. I told Mary yesterday, I'm tearing it down before he comes back to town. Amen. I just share that with you to tell you that the, the cornerstone is of significance. Amen. And somebody that's a master builder knows how to lay the cornerstone. All right. We have this, the introduction of this idea here in Isaiah chapter 28. You all enjoyed that way too much. <laughs> Verse number 16. Now Isaiah, this is a prophetic word. This is a prophetic word about the coming of Christ. And we'll verify that in the New Testament here in a minute. 700 years before Christ is born. 750 B.C. is when Isaiah roughly began his ministry. It's hard for us to kind of get in our heads 700 years. I mean, it was only 400 years ago that Columbus landed over there, you know, on one of those islands. 700 years before Christ, he writes these words. Isaiah writes these words. Therefore, verse 16, Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, the Lord said, the Lord God said, Look, I've laid a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The one who believes will be unshakable. And I'll make justice the measuring line and righteousness the mason's level. So that's construction kind of talk. The mason's line, the construction of it. God designed, started the design. God had this design in place before he spoke the universe into existence. And he knew, even Isaiah prophetically saying that Jesus, that the coming Messiah, Christ, was going to be a sure cornerstone for God's building. Okay, let's go to Acts chapter 4. The Mason's line, um, it, some of y'all, a lot of y'all are builder kind of people, and you know that you lay that cornerstone, all the lines, you know, just the stone itself is significant, but the placement of the stone, the exact line, the exact, if you're just a fraction of an inch off, the whole building's messed up. <clears throat> that's what that's about. And if, um, if we try to build our life, if we try to build our life, if we try to design our life around anything other than the, God's cornerstone, you know what? our life is going to end up with a bad foundation. Uh, you know, we live in a time where <clears throat> there's a lot of people who want to kind of say, well, whatever you think's right's right. Well, that ain't right. Whatever you think's right is not necessarily right. I mean, I saw this news article the other day, MSNBC, that's a network. MSNBC, they've got a correspondent works for MSNBC <clears throat> in an interview the other day. Let's see, her name is Melissa Harris, is the lady's name. Now, yeah, this I find this inconceivable. But Miss Harris actually said on MSNBC, and they were talking about childbirth. We've had some babies, amen? Dax is here. That, um, Jennifer and uh, Robert's son, Dax, they're not here today, but they're home from the hospital. We're excited about that. You know, when I was in, uh, I took a graduate course at UALR when we came back to Arkansas back in 81. It was called Death and Dying. It was, a, it was actually a graduate course for the UAMS, the medical system. And we studied the death and dying. We studied the industry of death and all that. It was really one of the best courses I took as far as preparing for actual ministry. Um, and I remember our professor back in 1981. How long ago is that? 30, 34 years ago? <clears throat> I remember he said the biggest moral challenge facing our country, uh, um, medical moral challenge, is going to be in the area of euthanasia, end-of-life issues, and, you know, we're kind of finding that true. We're talking about, you know, when do we decide to um, help somebody die? At what point? And then that's an active discussion. But also part of that, <clears throat> and this is where the Melissa Harris thing, and I've been hearing bits and pieces of this coming up for the last few years. Have you all heard this phrase yet called uh, <clears throat> post-birth abortion? Have you all heard of that phrase? 
that we actually have in, in the medical community and ethic, ethics community, we have people arguing that post-birth abortion ought to be considered as a moral appropriate. In other words, after a baby's born, we shil still should maintain the right to take its life after it's born. That's the little phrase, the little phrase, post-birth abortion. <clears throat> well, Miss Harris, on this program on, on MSNBC, even argued a step further that I just couldn't, I, I just blows my mind. <clears throat> Miss Harris said that, well, really, a baby shouldn't really be considered a living human until the parents decide it is one. I'm serious. Until the parents, oh, she didn't say decide. I'm sorry. She said until the parents feel like it's a living human being. And so she actually argued that parents should have the moral opportunity to decide to take that child's life up until it's three years old. Three years old. That until the parents feel like it's a living person. They should have that choice. Well, let me tell you, um, if that's kind of that's kind of an extreme example, but it's an example that's being discussed in medical ethic circles today. If you'd have told me that in 1981 that that would be a part of discussion, I'd have thought you were crazy, right? Uh, but it's on MSNBC, one of their advocates on that station. I, I just share that to say, you know, <clears throat> if, if we just start to draw moral decisions based on what we think, on what we feel, uh, that's a dead end road. God has a design. God has a plan. And God's design is built on a cornerstone, and that cornerstone is Jesus Christ. All right, let's look at our verse here. Chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> now, this is a reference back to the Isaiah passage. This is Peter, and that's preaching after Pentecost, those exciting, exhilarating days after the Spirit fell. <clears throat> this Jesus, verse 11, Acts 4, 11, this Jesus is the stone despised by you builders, who's become the cornerstone. There's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Amen? You know, one of the saddest verses in all the Bibles in the first chapter of John's Gospel, you know, John opens up his Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things that were made were made by Him. <clears throat> and then you go down to about verse number 10, and here's this sad verse. He says, he came into his own, and his own received him not. His own received him not. He came to his own. Isn't that heartbreaking? You know, we see that, like in the case of Miss Harris talking about, you know, how could a parent that has a living child in her hand say, I don't want this. This is not a living thing. You know, it's hard, that's just unthinkable. Unthinkable. But even how much more unthinkable is it to think that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, born of that Virgin Mary, came to his own, and they rejected him. They rejected him. Heartbreaking situation. <clears throat> Go to First Peter chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 4 through 8, 1 Peter 2, 4 through 8. <clears throat> well, let's start at verse 1. 1 Peter 2, verse 1. <clears throat> Here we're going to see that Jesus Christ is presented by uh, Peter as a living stone. 
And we're going to be kind of focusing on, just for a second on the fact that it's a stone that's alive. And then the last point will be, it's also in this text, is that God has made us living stones as well. Jesus is the living cornerstone, and we are living stones that God is going to build this indescribable glory out of. Verse 1, 1 Peter 2, 1. So rid yourselves of all wickedness, all deceit, hypocrisy, evil, and all slander. Like newborn infants, desire the unadulterated spiritual milk so that you may grow by it in your salvation since you've tasted that the Lord is good. Do you think God wants us to grow to mature as believers? Verse 4. Coming to him, a living stone, rejected by men but chosen and valuable to God, you yourselves as living stones are being built into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, and this is back to Isaiah, Look, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and valuable cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for the unbelieving, the stone that the builders rejected, this one's become the cornerstone. And look at verse 8. A stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that trips them up. And you can go on. <clears throat> have you noticed, have you happened to notice in our culture how the name Jesus, how Christ's name Jesus has become offensive in our culture? How offensive it's become? Oh, are you going to pray in Jesus' name? Or, you know, if, if there's a public meeting of any kind anymore, other than inside the walls of a church, if there's a public meeting and there's a prayer, one of the big bi uh, nail-biting questions is, is he going to say, in Jesus' name? Have you noticed how offensive Christ's name is becoming in our culture? You know, 40 years ago, I... I just couldn't even imagine that I would live to see the day that Jesus was offensive to our culture. It's offensive to businesses, you know. They try to wipe out any reference to Christ and the Word of God. It's offensive to them. You know, I was thinking a while ago, I heard some children earlier in the service, some babies kind of making noise over there. Don't you love the sound of that? I was thinking about that time that um, <clears throat> they were bringing children to Christ, wanting Jesus Christ to bless the children, you know, and some of the disciples, you know, they were like a lot of us stiff-necked Baptists. Oh, get these kids out of here. They're interrupting our worship service. They're inter we can't hear what you're saying real well. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus rebuked them. He said, you let the little children come to me. And if you try to shut them up, you try to shut them up, I'll make the stones cry out. Remember that? I'll make the stones cry out. Jesus Christ is a cornerstone. The line, the asthmus, you know, they've all been set, and they're all built, they're all measured by him, not by my opinion or yours, by the opinion of God. That's the opinion that matters. I think it would be time, I think it would be a good time for parents, for example, to realize that in this world, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ is not always welcomed in this world and becoming more and more offensive to this world that you and I live in. I think it'd be a good time. I think it's a sobering day. I think parents ought to, I think there's some parents with children that ought to make the teaching and training of their children in the cornerstone of Christ, the azimuth mark of Christ, a priority other than every little flipping activity the world has out there. Because you know what? It's not 1954 anymore. Our Savior is becoming very offensive in this nation today. 
Christ is the cornerstone. He's making out of us living stones. In 1 John chapter 3, in closing, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. You know, the first, second, third John toward the end, not the gospel. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. John writes um, one of the most intriguing statements. I mean, the, the whole word of God's awesome, amen? But as far as future, looking forward to the future, one of the most intriguing statements is there in 1 John 3, verse 2, where John writes and says this. We don't yet know what we're going to be. Speaking about after the resurrection. We don't yet know what we shall be. But we know that when we see him, we will be as he is. We will be like him. You know, in this master plan of God, the whole thing of Christ coming in the incarnate Son of God and the crucifixion on the cross and the resurrection from the dead, that was all planned from before this universe was created by God. It was, all, it was part of his plan. He's a master builder. He's got a plan in place. And I wrote this to a Greek professor. I had a question. I said, you know, I sent it to him. And I said, I just want you to read this. And if you don't see a problem with it, you don't need to respond. But if you see a problem, just write back. Just say red flag or something like that. And I said, here's, here's the, the statement I, I feel like I'd like to make. <laughs> And this was the statement that I sent to this professor. I said, the glorified person in Christ, after the resurrection, okay, the glorified person in Christ is something that God could not have simply created. It is something Jesus had to die for. Uh, he didn't respond. We're going to be living stones. God's building. God has a master plan. It was put in place before this world was created. So be encouraged. God isn't sitting up there biting his nails, wondering what's next. His plan's in place. He's laid the cornerstone. And he's making out of us believers living stones to build a habitation that God's going to dwell in forever. And as the scripture said in Ephesians, we'll be offering up sacrifice to the praise and glory of God. Let's bow for prayer. How does one... Um, how does one become a living stone? <laughs> it's really simple. Again, there in the first chapter of John's gospel, the gospel, I, I mentioned the verse where it says, he came to his own and his own received him not. Then it goes on to say, but as many as receive him, to them he gives the right to become children of God. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as receive him, he gives the right or the authority or the power to become children of God. Now, you talk about a gift. That's the greatest gift of all, to become a child of God. Not just a created thing, not a created person, but to become through the blood of Jesus a child of God. Don't miss that if you're here today without Christ. Receive him. Father, we come before you in the name of our Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your master plan, master builder, master architect, master engineer, and how you've been working since the first spoken word of your mouth. Speaking this universe into existence, your plan has been at work. 
and continues work today. And one day, you're going to bring it all together for your glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. Let's stand. Uh, Will, you lead us. If you have a decision maker or just want to come pray, feel free to do that or pray where you are. Do as the Lord directs today. And how deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch's treasure And how great the pain of searing love turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my King voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward?